Hello and welcome to uh, Movies and Tea. I'm your host, as always, Edward Jones, and joining me, of course, is our number one zombie slayer, Kim. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, on tonight's episode, we're going to be looking at One Cut of the Dead, the indie darling from 2017, uh, which opened to a festival screening of uh, roughly about 60 people, only to then go on to a huge uh, critical acclaim as they managed to turn a meager budget uh, into a whopping uh, $30.5 million return. For those obviously not familiar with One Cut of the Dead, it's a zombie comedy um, from Japan written by Shin Ikaro Yuda. I'm going to apologise in advance that I'm going to be probably butchering a lot of names because Japanese is really hard. The film itself, it follows a young student crew who are filming a zombie movie at a abandoned water filtration plant only for a real zombie apocalypse to break out. Or so it seems. So embarks on, so we are now taken on a rather unique film, which soon becomes a film within a film, as the cast are pitted with the ambitious task of shooting a zombie movie all in one take. But uh, Kim, I mean, this is obviously your pick for this After Hours blog, and is a film that I should have seen by now, but obviously hadn't because I've been distracted by other things. And what was it about uh, One Cut of the Dead that? made you want to obviously discuss it on the show tonight i think it's the it's the clever use of the film within a film i think that really makes this movie such a unique zombie film yeah um and plus i i mean i'm really really picky about comedy like especially horror comedy and this one just like Oh my god, it was so good. Like, I just, <laughs> I just can't. It was like, you really, you finish. It's just so clever because of just how it changes um, and the layers of the movie and that sort of thing. I don't want to talk too much about it because it, I think this movie hinges a lot on on that whole film within a movie, film within a film and how it's executed. Uh, which is the reason what that makes it so fun to watch at the same time because it's it becomes like packages of little surprises that you see and I mean like even for the the trailer when they released it it's like they go into it and then they're like okay you should stop watching this but if you want to keep going then if you're not scared of spoilers then go ahead you know type type of thing so I really like movies which it's great when you go in knowing the least possible and then it just successfully surprises you and really like takes this path where really I don't think a lot of movies have taken such a such a way of an appro- approaching a zombie comedy and especially now that zombie movies are so saturated like there's so much in the market that it's hard to see movies like this that are unique so therefore when you see movies that are taking a different turn or using a different view of how to do it and especially with they really play with that low budget and they really make it work that um i think it it, it's uh it's 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 one it was really impressive definitely so i mean as you said already i mean the zombie market is not really short of people out there trying to churn out their their zombie movies and when it comes to the zombie genre, it's always nice to see somebody actually trying to do something new with the material. I mean, this goes way back to when we look at like the original zombie movies, like White Zombie, and I walked with a zombie where zombies were basically this metaphor for slave labor. And then obviously Romero gets over, gets hold of uh, the zombies, and he turns them into like those glorious gut munchers. And then we obviously take the Italians see what Romero is doing and give it their unique twist, which of course amps up the violence and. We go throughout this, we see like all these little subtle changes, and it was always the films which are trying to push the boundaries. They're always the most interesting, be it like uh, Return of the Living Dead, which gave us like first running zombies and zombies that could talk. And we look at uh, even like offshoot films such as like Reanimator. And when you're going to still like the films which are like are just trying to do something new because they're always the ones that just really sort of grab your attention and the ones that are just sort of going through the motions of just like oh here's a zombie oh it's a group of kids in the wood or it's people running around abandoned streets at the foot like four in the morning like we see in direct like uh, the zombie diaries it, it it kind of makes you not want to really bother checking out anything that has got the word zombie in it and 
it as I said, it uh, means as a result that you get like films like this and like uh, Tokyo Zombie that just sort of uh, float under the sort of radar. So I was a pleasant surprise when we when I saw this. Much like Train to Busan, I thought Train to Busan was going to be oh just another tedious zombie movie. But that was really good as well. And mm-hmm. now when we have this. First of all, it surprised me just how good a zombie movie is, and then second, it surprised me that it's not essentially a zombie movie at all. It's really a film about making films. Um, it just how happens that you know there's uh, zombies in it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think at this point, I think I just, I just want to, <laughs> I just want to have a spoiler alert. Guess if you haven't seen the movie, I really do suggest you see it without listening to us talk about yeah. it. But then. But then, when you're done, you should definitely come back and listen to us talk about it. Because <laughs> I don't want to yeah. turn away any audience, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, but I mean, like, what's really great about One Cut of the Dead is the fact that it, it's just... I mean, the uniqueness of it is is in that whole one-take element, right? The movie in a movie is... It, it gives you that whole turning point. And I mean, if we dissect the movie, you can think about this movie in kind of, like, three parts. And the first part is kind of it takes you straight in it gives you no beginning no nothing you just jump straight into the zombies coming to life and the the movie being filmed and then there's you know the the director was a bit cuckoo and then all of a sudden 30 minutes in you start seeing credits roll and you're like what and it kind of just changes around and then you have this whole really great moment where we that at that moment when we get what happened in that first scene, we go back to how it all began. And I think that that was so clever because I remembered what, I don't know about you, but when I was watching this movie and then the movie ended, <laughs> after 30 minutes, I was like, excuse me, <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't be the only one. When they originally showed this film, there was a number of audience members who actually got up and left thinking the movie had to be ended in the film because I had to like tell them at least like, no, no, this is, this is just the start of the film. And, I don't know, maybe it's when it happens, you think, oh, well, that was a short movie. And you think, oh, well, it's, and the same time you think, well, it's a shooting movie. And I mean, they're obviously going to be too, have yeah. too much of a long thing. And then, and then at the same time, it's because that whole 30 minutes, there was a bunch of really random and weird things that happened. And then you're just like, excuse me? <laughs> you know, what? You, you just think about how this is such a low budget, weird movie and how it's just, it just fits into that description so well, right? But when it ends and then you go back and then you, you start back to where it began and the guy gets recruited and that's when you get your your actual opening credits and stuff like that. And then the whole title screen coming up. That's so unique because you, not a lot of movies will take that path. Like, sure, you might have an opening sequence of like 10 minutes, but not 30 minutes, right? Which is oh, like no, a third of not. the movie. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I've never actually seen um, a... a, a... A film sort of had the goal to go with it. I think trying to think what it was now. I think it was like um, strippers versus zombies or something, which has this uh, fake out opening like we see here, and it's it's ironic because the opening fake out is shot on better st- film stock than the actual film. Um, but here, yeah, it's it's really funny because they shoot this whole sequence all in one cut, and they actually went through the whole sequence six times to eventually get the shot that they want. But it's to shoot anything in one cut, I mean, everything has to be, like, perfectly timed. You can't just have, like, one person slip up at all. you just got to constantly keep rolling. And it really sort of ties into the actual, the original title for the film, which was uh, Don't Stop the Camera, or it's also known as Don't Stop Rolling, which I think is makes perfect, perfectly suits this uh, film, because it's all about just keeping the cameras rolling. Um <laughs> And certainly, when we get into the main the main film, and we're obviously introduced to um, our, our leading man, because I mean, it's the film itself is uh, is all directed, edited, written, and starred by. Um, um, is also oh, sorry, it's completely gone on the wrong track here. Um, the film itself, I mean, it as I say, it started off as this like in low independent project because all the the cast and crew were all part of a. Uh, a f- small filmmaking school and um, Chintro Utro uh, basically we directed, edited and wrote the script for the film and he's embodied here by uh, Takeuchi Hamatsu who's 
um, playing this sort of director who's got big aspirations of making this great zombie movie, and he manages to attract the attention of a of a, a TV network who are willing to fund his project. Uh, so we see him assemble his crew, and of course they're like they're basically like the Spinal Tap of film crews. There's, there's a, one of the sound guys are drunk. Um, the main actor's got a bit of an ego on him, and uh, everyone's sort of like basically Forrest Gumping this whole production across. Nobody really has any sort of like professional sort of skills, but they're all sort of enthusiastic about bringing this this project to Gavin. What obviously follows is uh, essentially the making of the film we see at the start of the film. But, you know, th- that's what's really great because once we get into, <coughs> like, the whole production is set and then we get the crew in and we see how odd everyone is, we step into the the, the filmmaking and then you start seeing the, all these things that happen and then what ends up is that he has to hire his crazy wife who who was a passe actress with... Yeah. For, for for reasons we will start realizing once they start filming and she has to and she is she has to take a role and you know and the daughter helps in her way because she's into directing as well and then she ends up helping with the not stopping the camera by having her creative takes on how to maneuver the situation when everything goes wrong <laughs> And I think that that's the great part is when we when we go back and we and literally the third part is where the movie is filmed. We watch every single part of the movie at the beginning being filmed. And what might be weird and 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 odd in the beginning now is just a bunch of hilarious is hilar- hilarity. It's just so hilarious to watch everybody go through these motions and then. You know that he has to manage everybody, and then every and all the behind the scenes that you see, while seeing and then while all of the all the odd things in the beginning are answered of why these things were happening in the in the first place, and then it all seems to make sense, which is one of the reasons why I like movies like this because it's not a, it's it's a surprising first watch, and it actually gives that second watch so much more fun because now you notice all these things that are happening because you know what actually happened like what the, what the whole deal is so you can watch that beginning movie with a different eye and and a different kind of understanding and you and, and I just think it's so clever that way yeah it's it it's really fun and funny I totally agree the fact that there's so many odd moments in in the start where you think oh that's an unusual choice to make and then when you see the actual behind the scenes and you see why why characters are acting a certain way or why things are done a, a particular way it's it's really it is really funny to uh to see especially as you said about the the director's wife who i have to say might be might just be my one of my favorite characters of this whole film um because she's she's essentially deranged at at points and um Especially towards the end when she just randomly keeps popping up even though she's not supposed to be in scenes. <laughs> um, yeah, well, her character her character is unique because the reason why they had to stop her from acting was because she doesn't like to follow the script. So, in the end, what happens is she, you know, all these things happen and then they, they have to try and contain her. And then it's just a matter of containing her while making sure the movie happens. So you hear her her little, like, self-defense stuff in the background where she makes the palm sound over and over again <laughs> off scene and all that stuff. <laughs> and then I said we got the drunk Salmon, who apparently was actually drunk for the whole of filming just to give it that realistic touch. <laughs> um, we also have um, former junior idol uh, Yazuki Akamimi. Who uh, shows up as uh, the assistant assistant DP? We see her running around. She's got um, she's the girl with the glasses on. So, if you're into junior idols and uh, follow for the career of the many idols that Japan produces, uh, you may get a kick out of obviously seeing her in the film as well. So, but other than that, as I say, it's a cast of all unknown actors. It's all people. It's all these uh, film film students who've basically just came together and shot a film in um in eight days and it's kind of inspiring in a way the the fact that here we have a group of kids with like no budget or no studio backing who just went out and shot a film 
um it's as i say it's just really sort of inspiring especially to sort of like young filmmakers out there who just like constantly get wrapped up in the idea of you know you need to have all this studio backing and they need to have all these different bits and pieces and you really don't you just go out and shoot films and if it's good it's good if it's bad it's bad and you go off and shoot someone else and that's what film school's about <laughs> just <laughs> shooting absolute dreck on somebody else's dollar as we said already i mean this is when you're combining elements of horror and comedy together it's a very difficult thing to do because you if you don't play it right it comes off hokey and especially if the humor's not sort of misfiring the stuff and i think this film i think has the advantage of obviously not being so purely focused on the horror aspect but also just like on the filmmaking aspect which puts it into that sort of unique category of like films within a film uh when we look at things such as like why don't you play in hell and lost in uh living in oblivion about you know these struggling indie filmmakers trying to make their films and just having to deal with the many crises happening around them and this is again what we see here it just happens to be that they're making a a zombie movie and yeah i would i just said i just really it just constantly kept me surprised all the way through and especially when you get to the end and we see uh a very creative use of a human pyramid is all i'm gonna say um <laughs> Because when I saw this, I saw this on Shudder, where you, where it's uh, currently Shudder exclusive, so you can you can watch it on there, and along with the likes of uh, Tigers Are Not Afraid, which we've also covered on an earlier episode of this show. Uh, Shudder really doing outstanding work for just getting their exclusive at the moment. They just really have it nailed down. Some of the titles they're getting as exclusives, and this certainly being one of them, but. I watched this uh, with the Joe Bob Briggs additional commentary as part of the last drive through, and he said, and, you know, he likes to list off all the things that are in there, and it's like human pyramid. It's like, where's a human pyramid going to work into this movie? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I really, I'm, I, the only thing I regret is the fact I didn't see this movie sooner. That's the only thing, I, the only regret I have. I just think this is was such a refreshing and positive film, especially in these crazy times. It was still like the perfect, perfect viewing. So. Yeah, and, and it's really nice because, I mean, they, they this team, they realize the importance of comedy during this crazy times that we're in. And they went along and they did one cut of the dead remote, mission remote. And they offered it for free on YouTube where they filmed a, a movie with the entire original cast of one cut of the dead. Yeah. And then... They did it all remote. Everybody filmed their own parts. <laughs> and then the director, like, sent it into the director and he put together this little film of, of just everything. And they all resumed their own roles and, 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 you know, did, like, a take two of that type of deal. Take two of One Cut of the Dead, but just in in the vicinities of their own house type of thing. Yeah. And it's, and it's every bit as ridiculous as this one is. But it just also very, very fun to watch it's i mean obviously it's not the same as watching it's, it's more of like a short film length um but it's it's definitely a an experience i mean they offered it for free so i mean if you if you are interested you can find it on youtube so fantastic um well the film did actually get some controversy as um the film itself was um was accused of being a ripoff of a another play called ghost in the box um, now, the um, original playwright uh, Ryuchi Wada uh, was considering legal action against the director, and they actually came to an agreement where he was basically given a credit in in the film as providing the inspiration, and they gave him also a, a cut of the profits as well. And it, and they were that was the um, they were, everyone was really happy with that. And I think compare this to the world from the West, and you've. You look at some of the many scandals that have obviously have embraced Hollywood of the when we look at like the scandals around um, coming to America that mm. raged on for like years and years and years before they like gave him a million dollars just to get him to go away. Um, and you compare it to this situation where everyone just like very amicably is like, yeah, we'll give you some credit and we'll give you some money. And everyone seemed quite happy with that. So if only the West was as easy as, uh, as Japan is at sorting its legal issues. I'm excited to see what they do next. That's my main main thing. I've got the feeling that this is going to be like one of the situations where we see you either working with the same sort of actors and crew on his next sort of project, and it becomes sort of like you know when you look at the Coens or Wes Anderson, where he's just sort of got this troop of actors that's following from project to project. So, 
Well, I mean, it's it's actually, well, it's not perfect timing because I don't know when this is going to come up. But when, as we're recording this, Fantasia is just around. Fantasia International Film Festival's virtual edition is just around the corner. And um, this year, his new, uh, Shinichiro Yuida's new movie is actually one of the opening day films, I believe, um, called Special Actors. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's a comedy. It's not supposed. It's not horror. It's just a comedy. But I think it's quite. I think it's a little bit similar to this, but also kind of like the absurd comedy sort of style. But it's it's working with the a- actor aspect instead of uh, instead of like the whole film filming aspect. I think. So for viewing, um, what would you pair with this film? I actually had a blank. I would have preferred choosing a film within a film sort of style of movie as for further viewing, but um, I couldn't think of any. I know I know some, but I just can't think of any. Um, so I decided to go with um, another movie that I thought was a really unique zombie movie and a nice kind of blend of two genres, and that's An- Anna and the Apocalypse. Which oh, is nice, a good. zombie musical, so that one was. I mean, I have a lot of fun with that one. Um, it's a it's, zombie Christmas musical <laughs> as yeah, well. Exactly, so. exactly, and and it's it's really it, and I mean, and the apocalypse was is, is one that's it's it's just a lot of fun to watch. You don't. It, it's very unexpected that someone would take uh, a zombie movie, obviously, and turn it into a musical. Uh, but what? Well, but I mean. I mean, I was obsessed with this movie the, after the first time I saw it, and I think I watched it, like, I think ten times over two weeks or something like that. So, uh, <laughs> definitely recommend it, especially if you want to watch it for Christmas or you want to watch it for Halloween. It really fits in both both <clears throat> times. Yeah, definitely fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, for myself... yeah. Um, sorry, I should have asked if you had any others. In, no, no, no. I was gonna. Uh, uh, and how about you? What were your further viewing? Uh, for myself, I mean, there's a few options that you can obviously go for. I mean, if you want to watch more sort of Asian uh, zombie movies, I mean, you can obviously look at Bio Zombie, um, which has that wonderful opening where you think you're watching a pirate movie, uh, but you're actually not. It's just the unique way the film chooses to open. Um, Again, you can another good one is uh, Tokyo Tokyo Zombies. Also, a lot of fun as well. It's a really good zombie comedy. Both of those films, as I said, are both uh, zombie comedies, which is always a welcome thing. Um, as for the film within a film, I mean, as I mentioned already, just check out Why Don't You Play in Hell, uh, which is by Sion Sono, which is these films a group of filmmakers uh, filming a filming a brawl between uh, rival Yakuza clans. Um, you also got Living in Oblivion, which has got uh, Steve Buscemi as a young director trying to uh, keep his crew, t- crew together as he tries to film his uh, student shorts. And features an early appearance by Peter Stormare. And uh, really sort of, many people said it's sort of like, uh, see, as the, see him as the inspiration for Buscemi's own career as a director, just seeing these early footsteps of him and him directing. So... But um, no, I mean, those would be the main ones I would sort of go to. I mean, you can also look at Civil Be Demented, which is also about young filmmakers as well. Um, and probably one of the lesser John, known John Waters movies, uh, but still kind of worth watching as well. Awesome. So yeah, that would be my picks. I mean, there's, it, it, as I said, when it comes to finding a good zombie movie, when you find a good one, you kind of want to rave to everyone it's about it. Um, it's like when 28 Days it came out nobody expected that to be as good and same can be said for like Shaun of the Dead mm. um, Shaun of the Dead is, would be an actually really good pairing for this one too yeah I mean again that walks that great line of like when it wants to be funny it's really funny and when it wants to be scary it can still be scary I mean there's some really generally good zombie movie moments within that film and it, you can see how much that you know Sam Pegg and Edgar Wright both love Romero zombie movies because the influences are just like shown completely throughout that film. Um, I mean, Edgar Wright has obviously gone on to say that you know, Dawn of the Dead is his Sunday afternoon viewing, <laughs> which I can totally understand. Once you've seen that film a few times, you and you, you know, you've know where the scares are and stuff. I mean, that is perfect. Like Sunday afternoon viewing, it's really relaxing to watch. Mm. In that weird kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that's the reason we all now think of like hiding out in malls when we have like the zombie apocalypse. This uh, brings us to the end of another episode of Movies and Tea. Thank you, as always, for listening. Uh, you can obviously check out our full archive episodes at moviesandteapodcast.wordpress.com. And you can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, and if you haven't done already, please do hit the like and subscribe button wherever you happen to be leaving to us, listening to us. And uh, leave us a review. It all helps raise the profile of the show. Um but as I said, thank you uh, again for listening. And Kim, I mean, obviously, we're now, as we record this, we're getting ready for, to go into production for season six. And it's kind of a change of pace for us because we're not just choosing one director as we normally do, we're choosing several directors. Yeah. Uh, I mean, next, next time we're going to be focusing on some notable female directors who. We normally wouldn't have enough uh, movies to do an entire season of, but have shown, between both of us, obviously, some of the movies, you know, Elwood's seen and some of the movies I've seen, um, that really do give them a unique eye in cinema, that we want to cover the movies that they've done. Um, well, at least we've picked one movie for each female director. I don't think we have any repeats. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's just say we're highlighting some female directors in the next season. And um, it should be pretty fun. I mean, we have some movies that we both haven't seen. We have some movies that one of us have seen. And we have movies. I think we have one or two that both of us have seen. Yeah, but, it's yeah. it's a pretty diverse canvas that we're going to be, be covering. Because we're, normally when we talk about female directors, it's always like this sort of art house and period drama sort of uh, productions, unless it's like a Sofia Coppola um, piece that they're sort of writing, who's sort of like one of those directors who sort of stands out, or even like Catherine Bigelow. So we, what we wanted to do is just like, you know, look at the direct female directors out there who are making like interesting films, and um, and some of those who just perhaps don't get the recognition that they truly deserve, and those are going to be the ones we're going to be celebrating over the course of our next season. So hopefully you join us for that. And um, I, as I said, I'm looking at uh, what we got ahead. I think it's going to be a really fun, fun, varied uh, schedule of uh, films that we've got programmed in. So hopefully uh, you enjoy joining us for those as much as we're going to enjoy checking them out ourselves. But um, until then, thank you as always for listening. Thank you to my co-host Kim. And uh, we'll be back very soon with season six of Movies and Tea. Until then, good night.